Let me give you a quotation, which I found quite useful in this context, from Stephen Hawking, uh, from a page in A Brief History of Time, which I don't think anybody ever got up to, uh, but uh, I picked it out at random, I should say. And uh, here it is, from Hawking. The idea that space and time should be finite without boundary is just a proposal. It may initially be put forward for aesthetic or metaphysical reasons, but the real test is whether it makes predictions that agree with observations. This, however, is difficult to determine. Just notice that last phrase. He makes the gesture that all good scientists must make. There have to be, in the end, predictions, observations. There has to be some sort of empirical testing. But actually, in modern science, that is very difficult to determine how you would do it. Nobody, to my knowledge, has yet thought how you could possibly test string theory by observation. There is no way that anybody's thought of doing it. That doesn't mean string theory doesn't exist. People still get paid for inventing it. So science has moved a long way beyond just observing, recording, and then sticking to what you've seen. It's theory-laden to such an extent that the theory drives the observations. Not only that, the theory is so sophisticated that if most of us had the observations that would confirm it, we wouldn't know whether it had been confirmed or not. We wouldn't have the slightest idea. You go to CERN in Geneva and they, you get a sort of photographic plate and on it there are lots of little lines and blurs and splotches and things. And somebody says to you, oh, well, that confirms the theory about, you know, the z naught particle. Well, would it? You know, you look at it and you say, oh, yes, yeah, so it does. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have the slightest idea. So you don't even know in modern science how to interpret the observations without a huge amount of theory. That's the point, right? So the theory, in a sense, comes before the observation, right? You've got to have observation, but the, th the relation between the observation and the theory is very indirect. It has to be there. And I suggest to you that believing in God is very like that. That is to say, if I put God into Stephen Hawking's quotation, the idea that there should be a God who creates the universe for a purpose is just a proposal. It may initially be put forward for aesthetic or metaphysical reasons, but the real test is whether it makes predictions that agree with observation. That's true. Sooner or later, somebody will have to have some observations that show that there is a God, if there is a God. That's true. But this, however, is very difficult to determine, because in order to do that, you would have to be dead. It's presumably only after you're dead that you see whether there's a God or not, uh, if there is a God, right? If there isn't a God, you won't see anything, so it wouldn't matter. But that is exactly the sort of thing that modern physics says. You know, it's quite difficult to determine. You've got a theory, you accept the theory because it's elegant, because it's comprehensive, because it's fruitful, uh, all sorts of reasons. It unites different uh, sorts of knowledge uh, into one pleasing aesthetic whole, perhaps. Uh, and in the end, you say, well, there must be some observational tests. But they're very difficult to determine. It's not always straightforward. So in the case of God, you have factors which favor God. That is, people do claim to experience God. They claim to have experiences of transcendent reality and power. About 50% <coughs> of, of most populations claim that. Uh, but on the other hand, you have the problem of suffering and evil and all sorts of difficulties that people have uh, with belief in that way. <coughs> so it's difficult to determine. And we haven't got a conclusive test, but it's just like string theory, right? The difference, of course, between string theory and belief in God is that belief in God is not chosen because it's a good theory. String theory is. I mean, belief in God is chosen because of a response to what is believed to be divine self-disclosure. Uh, for Christians, that comes in the person of Jesus Christ, but for other religions, it would come in other ways, like uh, revelation in the Quran or in the Hebrew Bible, for example. But somewhere, people come to think God has spoken to them, God has called them, God has uh, almost compelled them to respond with an affirmation of trust. So that's what religion is founded on. There's nothing like that in string theory. 
well, there shouldn't be anyway, although some scientists do claim to have had things revealed to them in their dreams, but uh, so there even some similarity there. But of course, religion is not primarily a theoretical matter. It's primarily a practical matter of commitment and the way you live, the way you see things. Science is theoretical. So the only point I'm making, I'm not making them identical, the point I am making is that intellectual understanding is much more important in modern science than sense experience. And Hume's philosophy simply cannot account for that at all. So when Hume says, with what assurance can we decide concerning the origin of worlds, Stephen Hawking would say, with a very great deal of assurance, as a matter of fact. And we have to take that into account if we're looking for a reasonable philosophy. So that's the first point from the dialogues. <coughs> as I say, I've got five. The second one is about evil. Uh, now, this is obvious. I mean, everybody's thought of the problem of evil, if God is supposed to be good. Uh, and uh, uh, so Hume raises that problem in the dialogues, and I can't completely ignore it, so I don't want to say too much about it at this point. Uh, what I'll say is this, and again, I'll appeal to science. I'll appeal to a great atheist, Nobel Prize-winning physicist, Steven Weinberg, who says in his book, Dreams of a Final <laughs> Theory, <coughs> that perhaps there is a final theory of the universe, and by that he means a theory which would show that this is the only universe, and these are the only laws, and these are the only fundamental constants that would be compatible mathematically with the existence of carbon-based intelligent life forms. Okay, let me make that point again, that there are serious physicists, Steven Weinberg among them, who is, who is an atheist, so has no axe to grind, who would hold that uh, if there are going to be intelligent life forms, anything at all like us in this universe, then the fundamental laws of nature, like the law of gravity, has to be, they have to be what they are. And of course, then you see that if the law of gravity exists, it's going to have unfortunate effects on people who jump off cliffs. So if the law of gravity exists, there is going to be suffering in the universe. It's going to happen. Uh, and it's always going to be possible, whether it happens or not. So in a way, science can give you, again, an intellectual, it perhaps is not very satisfying emotionally, give you, give you an intellectual response to why evil exists, <coughs> why suffering exists. And the answer would lie in showing the necessity of the laws of nature to having things like us existing. It's a bit like saying, well, if you love mountain climbing, as I do, uh, you will accept that a lot of the uh, fun of mountain climbing is that you might fall off. Now, falling off is not fun, don't get me wrong, uh, but the fun of it is knowing that you could fall off and that you're very clever because you don't. Uh, and you will accept that, of course, other people do and that you might. Uh, extreme sports are even worse. I mean, really extreme sports. People do it because it's dangerous. Now, don't ask me about psychology. All I'm saying is, uh, it's not the case that a universe without any possibility of suffering and death and failure in it would be obviously better than this one. Right? There may be deep necessities in the world which make the world the way it is. I'm not solving the problem of evil. I'm saying, again, uh, if you look for an intellectual understanding of that matter, then perhaps uh, science can actually help by showing the necessity of some of the fundamental laws of nature and things like the fact that carbon atoms are only formed in the explosions of stars. So you only get life if stars explode. But if you're anywhere near a star, when it expl explodes, it's going to hurt, again, for a very short time. So then, uh, you know, it, but into the universe there is destruction as well as creation. Not a complete answer, but I think what it shows is it's not just an easy thing to say, oh, well, there's suffering in the universe, therefore a good God couldn't have created it. Uh, you can say that that's not quite so obvious. We would need to understand a lot more about what's necessary to having a universe like this before we could make that argument. And these things are indeed difficult to determine. So that's the second point. The third point is one that interests me mostly, but it bores everybody else completely, so I, I'll not spend too much time on it. It's the problem of necessity. Uh, this has fascinated me all my life, but people go to sleep as soon as I start talking about it. So I'll try and I'll watch out for the symptoms. Hume says this, it's become a very famous statement, whatever, 
we conceive as existent, we can also conceive as non-existent. <laughs>